Now, uh, I'll call upon Dr. Gopal Pillai. Uh, Dr. Gopal is going to talk on uh, retinal complications of cataract surgery. Dr. Gopal. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, madams. Thank you very much, all the other speakers, for letting me do. Um, so, retinal complications usually come as the last topic. And it is nice that I have some people to hear that now. At least, uh, uh, I, I, I see it only after it is occurring, but at least other people who do a lot of cataract surgery definitely should be doing that. So let's start up and say there will be some block-related complications, vascular blocks, supracoroidal hemorrhage, yes, it is a very, very um, uh, problematic thing, light toxicity, nucleus and eye oil drop, cystoid macular edema and endophthalmitis. Local anesthesia related, if you are looking at it, like this is a needle which you are blindly inserting through the side of the globe and anything and everything can happen. Usually the first year PG is the, the person who does that. Uh, so there are three clinical situations. One clinical situation is that, you know, the astute clinician in the PG or whoever is giving the block, you know, found out that the needle is inside the globe, understood that it is inside the globe and immediately took it out. Okay, that is the first situation. The second situation is, the person injected in, inside the globe, didn't realize that it is inside the globe and injected the block, whatever, inside the globe itself, okay? Number three situation is even more uh, uh, tricky. You went inside and then you went outside also and in the correct plane you injected. So three, three situations are there. Now let us see how each would present. The first situation would present like, uh, you know, there would be a perforation. And, uh, the, and then if you are, if you are careful, there may be a subconjunctival hemorrhage there. And usually when the needle is going in, there is going to be severe pain when the sclera is getting perforated. Now the second situation is a little troublesome because if you inject the block, whatever it is, inside the eye, then the pressure will immediately shoot up and the cornea will become steamy white. Immediately there will be corneal edema which will be coming in and the patient will have intense, severe pain and uh, the cornea will become immediately white. Number three, nobody knows. I mean, neither the uh, person who gave the block, neither the patient, nor the surgeon will know and the surgeon will complete the FACO and uh, post-operatively, I mean, intraoperatively, if you give a uh, massage or something like that, there can be a hypotony. But otherwise, you will not even know and you may consider doing the surgery, go ahead and after that, finally, you may end up with a retinal detachment later or a vitreous hemorrhage later. These are the three situations. Now, this after perforation, pre-retinal blood and vitreous hemorrhage was there in this particular case with a retinal localized retinal detachment was there. And we did a vitrectomy with fluid air exchange and sil silicon oil. So this is a very, very good prognosis. Immediately, if you do, yes. If there is a percolating subretinal hemorrhage which has moved into the macula or something like that, yes, then there is a bad prognosis. Otherwise, this is very, very good prognosis. Now, this is a patient in whom there was this lid uh, damage, okay, and somebody gave a little local anesthesia there, but because the there is a little bit of scarring, the needle inadvertently because of the force went inside and went inside. Now, this is a telltale sign. You can see this, this air bubble is a telltale sign that you have actually uh, perforated because you can have air bubble inside the eye only after perforation, right? Now, this patient came to me with complete loss of vision to almost PL plus. And when I looked at it, the optic nerve was slightly pale. Uh, and uh, I mean, there was nothing much, like 57 seconds was the, uh, you know, this was the uh, uh, arterial and venous filling. So there was no central retinal artery occlusion. There was no significant optic nerve damage. So I was like, patient's vision is PL. Probably it's like because the pressure that uh, the patient was injected with that block inside the globe. So probably that pressure uh, caused a functional optic nerve damage. And 24 hours down the line, I had given an IV methyl prednisolone actually. And uh, 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 24 hours down the line, this patient improved to six by six. Now, if there is a break, now what should we do if there is a perforation? Definitely you should do an indirect ophthalmoscopy. That's a natural next thing. So if you do, uh, do an indirect ophthalmoscopy and if there is a, uh, tear which is found and if you have a possibility of doing a cryo or laser then under that's you can seal the deal there. If VR support is not available and then conservative uh, um, treatment you can basically slowly refer the patient but I don't think unless the cataract is very hard and the visibility to the retina is absolutely not there I think we should defer the surgery of that particular patient. So uh, steroid antibiotic cycloplegic and probably refer to a VR surgeon. Now, this is again another patient who had been operated for LASIK, high myopic patient. This is a patient like the third situation. This patient came with a late 
a retinal detachment. Probably there was a perforation in, perforation out, and the surgeon did not know, neither the uh, person who gave the block knew. And there is a late onset retinal detachment, and uh, we had operated, and finally visual, visual acuity was very good. Now, whenever the pressure inside the eye increases, especially in optic nerves, which are quite labile as in advanced glaucoma, or sometimes in diabetic discs, there could be, or if there is a retrobulbar hemorrhage, or if you massage too much, or you apply a balloon or a pinky or something like that, then you may have a central retinal artery occlusion or a venous occlusion in those patients. Now, you know, central retinal vein occlusion and uh, BRVOs, all of them, usually you have to find out how much is the edema and generally consider injection, etc. Now, central retinal artery occlusion will have these cherry red spots and the uh, vessels would be like cattle trucking will be there. So, these uh, signify that there was a very, very high pressure during uh, surgery. All right. Now, expulsive hemorrhage. Expulsive hemorrhage is a rare problem, but very, very serious. And uh, less seen now with the smaller incisions and the FACO incisions that we have, it is very, very less seen. Sudden increase of IOP will be there. And there will be darkening of the glow and wound gape and iris prolapse with expulsion. And close wound immediately with digital pressure or sutures is what is to be done. Sometimes you can do a posterior sclerotomy and allow the escape of the suprachoroidal blood. Light toxicity sometimes occurs if you are, if you are a novice surgeon studying a new technique, taking more time, then uh, generally this light toxicity will come. There may be some systemic macular edema or RP burn which will be there. Choroidal detachment, if there is a hypotony post-operatively, if there is a wound leak post-operatively, there could be a choroidal detachment which can come, sir, come up and then that will induce more hypotony and hypotony will induce choroidal detachment and that vicious cycle may go on. To break it, probably you will have to increase the uh, uh, steroid dosage and uh, do that. Okay. Now this is a choroidal detachment. Ischemic optic neuropathy. Sometimes what happens in FACO, people keep bottle very high and in susceptible optic discs, you can have an intraoperative AIOM. And I had published a series of seven cases of intraoperative AIOM following FACO emulsification. So the incidence is quite uh, not so uh, common. But if there is AIOM in one eye, then the other eye is uh, very highly likely. This is an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. You can see the one eye, one side there is a pale disc edema and other side there is still injectasia. Okay, vitreous hemorrhage, any blood in the anterior segment can just go into a posterior segment if there is a PC rent. So that's a, uh, if there is a PC rent, please make sure that there is no blood in the anterior chamber like that. Mild hemorrhage you can observe, if there is massive hemorrhage you can do a vitrectomy. Now this is a, uh, uh, you can see that this is a uh, nucleus drop, oops, the video is not running, it's okay. Nucleus drop is managed by, uh, generally I would ask all my friends to put up uh, lens, Immediately, even after the nucleus drop is there, clean the anterior segment up, put a lens on the because generally if you want a uh, multi-piece IOL, uh, three-piece IOL on the, on the sulcus. And uh, generally now, 23 gauge phaco fragmenters are available. Call your vitreoretinal friend. Please have a vitreoretinal friend, okay? So uh, call a vitreoretinal friend and tell him that there is a nucleus drop, so he will advise. And based on that, you manage it then and there because all this patient hanky-panky, let's avoid all that. So dislocated nuclear fragment or lens matter can cause high intraocular pressure and that high intraocular pressure and uveitis can be managed like that. IOL can also be dropped. This is an ultrasound of the posterior dislocated lens, etc., etc. Cystoid macular edema usually occurs later. Yeah, let's stop. No, please wind up. Okay. So cystoid macular edema and uh, endophthalmitis. These are two terrible complications. Uh, cystoid macular edema is still all right. You can manage with NSAIDs and then posterior septinon. Endophthalmitis has to be managed as early as possible with an intravitreal injection or if the vision drops with vitrectomy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One, how much pressure in the eye induces AI rent? So it's very variable, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the venous, the, the arterial pressure of the central artery, artery, central retinal artery is about 35, 35 to 40. Okay. So that is a pressure with which blood is coming into the eye. And the pressure system of the venous side is about 25 millimeters of mercury. So theoretically, if you move up more than 25, a central retinal vein occlusion can occur in a susceptible person. And more than 45, you can get a central retinal artery occlusion. But practically, we don't see that. So for a longer period of time, if your pressures are like 60 or 65 or 70, 
then you may get CRVO or CRAO or ischemic optic neuropathy. So that is a con that is a thing that everybody has to consider whenever the bottle height is very very high. Now the bottle height is high and you have an open I mean you have a you don't have a watertight chamber. Like for example, phaco wound is still a little bit leaky. Not like the vitrectomy where it's completely watertight. If it is watertight like the vitrectomy and you are putting the bottle up there, you are definitely going to have some problem. But in phaco, because of this leakage, sir, 40 millimeters bottle height is equal to 40 millimeters of mercury pressure. That is that is about 90 to 100 pressure. Yeah, that's not good. That is much over 70. Yeah, that is not good. But that, that is why I am telling sir, there will be some wound leak. There will be some uh, blood which will be expelled through the sides of the wound in a phaco. So, it may not be effectively 70, 80, 90 inside. That's point number one. Point number two, most of the phaco surgeons are now very, very rapid in the surgery. In about two, three minutes that, that phase is over. Okay. So, if it is a novice surgeon learning for about 45 minutes to one hour, then we have a problem. Because we never looked for it, sir. So there are some patients in whom post-operatively visual recovery was not 100% HD. So we said, okay, this is there. But once we recognize this problem and when you look back at it, you will also see that there will be some cases like that. So in fact, we are irrigating and aspirating at the same time. No, so that that's why that's yes. why the yes. the the, 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 the yeah. 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 So those more. more. Yes. I'm not telling that every case so will land up in that. Yeah. But we have to be. Yeah, we have in predisposed cases, we have to be careful about it. Yes, definitely. The second question, right? Suppose you have a cortical <coughs> fall due to the vitreous Cortex. Cortex. Yeah. How much of cortex would you say we don't touch? Yeah. We yeah. Sir, cortex. about 20 years back, we would say that 25% of the cortex, if it is there, we will leave it there and give steroids, etc. That age is gone. Yes. That age is gone. Cortex inside will cause cystoid macular edema, will cause uveitis, will cause increased mitral pressure. Should be removed. Any amount. Agree. Any, any amount. And same for the nucleus. Any fluid. Absolutely. Because nucleus will induce I, IOP rise very, very high. Now, it's like, now because we have transformed from the 6 by 18 cataract surgery, 6 by 36 cataract surgery to 6 by 6, 6 by 6 parts cataract surgery, sir. So, we can't leave cortex in the vitreous. A small plate floats down in front of you through the gap. And you think such a small plate should be dissolved. So it's a surgeon's philosophy, sir. So because let's let's think that this flake went down and dissolved, nothing happened. It's okay. But now uh, I am not telling that this small flake or speck, if it induces a cystoid macular edema tomorrow, then you'll have to do it, no? No, but the, at the moment the surgeon has to take a decision. Do I call the vitreous, vitreous guy in, or should I let him use the small flake? Uh, the small flake that most of the cataract surgeons tell me, finally when I take out, it ends up to be a very large flake. <laughs> that also is a major problem. Okay. So a small nucleus bit, about 50% of the nucleus will be inside. No, Okay, sir, for bargaining sake, I will say that it is okay. <laughs> it's okay then, let it be. <laughs> no, I think uh, the. Uh, let us see Sanjay the patient post operatively. Will you tell the patient that the small nucleus, I mean, cortex flake is down? Will you tell the but patient? But the cortex, where if you. If you no, will you tell the patient? <laughs> no, I think, uh, Sanjay, yes, the important thing is like. Uh, will you not tell the patient. Eh? And then if the patient comes back with floaters or cystoid macular edema, yeah. how are you going to talk to the patient? <laughs> that is going to be a lie, right? It's going to be a tricky. Yeah, I, that's all. <laughs> uh, Sanjay, I think uh, it depends on whether you have uh, the fragment is the nucleus or the cortex. Cortex generally, because if you are left with the small uh, flake of the cortex, it is get absorbed in a three to four days. I don't think there is any time to induce CME. But if it is a nuclear piece, it remains for a longer time. Then there is always a chances so of the having the quantity of the cortex is all important, sir. Quanti the small flag we are talking. Yeah, yeah, if it's yeah. a small flag, yeah. then I don't think there Maybe. should be much okay. problem. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, uh, Dr. Gopal, for the nice.